Ronald Clark O'Brien lived in Deer Park, Texas with his wife and two children. The year was 1974. He was an optician and deacon at his church. His financial situation apparently was dire. Records indicated that he was more than $100,000 in debt. To get out of his situation, he came up with a scheme to buy poison and put it in pixie sticks, which is a sugary powdered candy. During the months before Halloween, O'Brien bought $30,000 in life insurance policies for each of his children. On Halloween morning, he bought cyanide from a garden shop. That fateful Halloween night, O'Brien gave the pixie sticks to five children, including two of his own. His eight-year-old son, Timothy, asked for one first. It was kind of a cold and kind of a misty, damp night, remembers Harold Nassif, a former detective sergeant who investigated the case. Since it had been raining, Mr. O'Brien had a raincoat on. He had the pixie sticks shoved up the sleeves of his raincoat. When the O'Briens got home, Ronald urged his son Timothy to try the candy. Timothy immediately started vomiting and convulsing after eating the candy. Ronald later testified that he hailed his son as he died. An uproar went through the neighborhood looking for other poisoned candy. Four sticks were found still in children's bags and one stick was found unopened in bed with a child. Thankfully though, none of the other children had eaten theirs. O'Brien said he was shocked, even giving an emotional eulogy at his son's funeral. When Timothy's body was brought to the morgue, the medical examiner recalled the scent of almonds coming from the boy's mouth, which is often a telltale sign of cyanide poisoning. An autopsy later confirmed that Timothy had consumed enough cyanide to kill two or three grown men. Eventually, the police learned about O'Brien's purchase of the cyanide and life insurance policies, and a Harris County grand jury charged him with capital murder. O'Brien maintained his innocence, but a jury took less than an hour to convict him. On June 3rd, 1975, after less than an hour of deliberations, a Harris County jury convicted O'Brien of murder and sentenced him to death. O'Brien was executed 10 years after his son's passing on March 31st, 1984. On Halloween night in 1998, in the Bronx, New York, teenagers threw eggs at a car. The eggs probably cost the boys a few dollars, but they cost Carl Jackson his life. Carl and his girlfriend were picking up her nine-year-old son from a children's party. Carl had just turned 21 just weeks earlier. He was a quiet young man, the son of a nurse and a postal worker. He usually avoided going out on Halloween because he thought it was too dangerous, but he made an exception this time. When the teenager's eggs hit their car, Carl stepped out of the vehicle. An argument began. Carl had sat back in the passenger seat when one of the teenagers pulled out a weapon and opened fire, hitting Carl in the head and ending his life. I think it took us about two years to even talk about it, said Gloria Jackson, Carl's mother. We were just devastated. We never thought that anyone from our family would be murdered, especially on a holiday for something stupid. Every Halloween on the anniversary of Carl's passing, his family members gather at Woodlawn Cemetery in the Bronx. They write messages to him. On painted stones, they leave at his grave. Carl's grandmother, Sally Bagley, still keeps a pair of his shoes at the top of the stairway. The teenager prosecuted for ending Carl's life, Curtis Sterling, was just 17 years old when he was arrested. Sterling was sentenced to 20 years in prison. Jackson's mother, according to the New York Times, sends him a Halloween card every year, stating that she's happy that he's still behind bars. A massive outdoor Halloween party was held at a rural property in Frenchtown Township, Michigan in October 2014. Reports say more than 600 people attended and 22-year-old Chelsea Ellen Brooke wearing a poison ivy costume was among the guests. According to court records, Chelsea drove to the party with friend and coworker Laura Taylor at approximately 10 p.m. on October 25th. Chelsea took an overnight bag, change purse, and cell phone with her, but left them in Taylor's vehicle. Taylor gave Chelsea's bag, purse, and phone to their mutual friend, Becky Brinson, before leaving the party at approximately 1 a.m. Unable to find Chelsea before she left the party, Brinson took Chelsea's property with her. Between 1 a.m. and 3 a.m., Chelsea approached multiple people at the party to use their cell phones. Despite this, Chelsea did not make it home that night or the next night, and on October 27th, 2014, 
Chelsea's parents reported her as a missing person. Within two days, a massive search began. Tents were erected and police were coordinating efforts. Hundreds of searchers became involved, sparking widespread media coverage at the time. On April 5, 2015, the first big public break in the case was discovered. Chelsea's poison ivy costume was recovered at an abandoned industrial site on Peters Road in Flat Rock, Michigan. Later that month, human remains, which were later discovered to belong to Chelsea, were recovered in a shallow grave off Briar Hill Road in Ash Township in a heavily wooded area about 10 miles away from where the party was held. According to CBS, her body was found with no clothes on. Crime scene investigators collected DNA evidence on the leggings Chelsea was wearing. In July 2016, the same month, a Newport, Michigan man with a lengthy criminal record, Daniel Clay, was charged in a separate sexual conduct case. The crime lab confirmed a hit connecting Clay to the DNA sample. Clay was arrested on July 22, 2016 at his girlfriend's mobile park home. He was 27 years old at the time of his arrest. Clay's girlfriend, Kelly Richter, told the free press that he had confessed to the crime during a cell phone call with her. During questioning by police, Clay admitted he was involved in Chelsea's passing, according to Monroe County Sheriff Dale Malone. Clay was charged with second-degree murder. Later, he was also charged with one count of concealment of a body. His murder charge was eventually upped to open murder, allowing the jury to consider a first-degree premeditated murder charge, which carried a mandatory life sentence. During the trial, Monroe County Sheriff Detective Brian Sroka testified that after Clay was arrested in July, he admitted he had taken Chelsea's life, but maintained it was an accident. According to Sroka, Clay told detectives that he and Chelsea were hooking up and she asked him to choke her for about 20 to 30 seconds. And that's when she stopped breathing and he tried CPR, he claimed, but he couldn't revive her. He told detectives that he, quote, freaked out. Sroka said, quote, he didn't call police, so he began to drive around for 30 to 45 minutes, end quote. Clay said he drove to some train tracks about 10 miles from the party's location, then carried the body from the vehicle into a wooded area until he became tired and hid it under some tree branches. Soroka testified. Then he moved the body farther into the woods before leaving it hidden under more tree branches. Clay told detectives that Chelsea was wearing a handmade costume of the Batman villain, Poison Ivy, when he met her at the Halloween party. As Clay was leaving, he saw her walking on the side of the road, carrying her wig. Investigators say, quote, he pulled up next to her, asked if she wanted a ride. She said she did. She got into the vehicle, according to Sroka. An autopsy by the Wayne County Medical Examiner's Office showed Chelsea actually died of blunt force trauma. A jury found Clay guilty of first degree murder on May 16th, 2016. He was sentenced to life in prison on July 13th, 2017.